Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Physics 506, Yanam. And uh, let me first introduce myself a little bit. My name is Kai Sang, and uh, I'm a theoretical physicist, and my research focuses on uh, quantum condensed matter physics and quantum many body physics. And uh, in the previous semesters, most of the time, uh, I have been teaching uh, the advanced graduate and advanced undergraduate courses, the upper 400 level and the upper 500 level. So for 506, it's my first time to teach this course. I taught uh, 505 and I'm the first semester before, but for 506, it's the first semester I'm teaching this. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, as I will explain to you slightly later, so this semester, I'm, uh, I'm setting up, I'm testing a new setup for this course. So I will uh, welcome very much your comments and the feedbacks about this uh, course and about this new setup. Okay, so I also list my phone number and the link to my homepage and my email address. Uh, if you have any questions or want to uh, reach me, uh, you can send me an email, okay? And we also have a GSI and a grader, Ms. Dagger, and she will uh, grade the homeworks, uh, etc. And uh, this is her contact information. Uh, for time and places. So traditionally, 506 will be on Monday and Wednesday. Okay? So this semester is a little bit special. This semester, because everything is fully online and the student service don't even assign a, a, a date or time for our course, but we will follow the tradition. We will uh, basically, uh, I will post the video and the lecture notes for each lecture on uh, one, uh, uh, one Monday and one, uh, one on Monday and one on Wednesday for every week, uh, except for the, uh, the, the uh, uh, school holiday and the school break days. Okay? And the lecture will be online, fully online, and it will be uh, unsynchronized. Okay? So basically I will pre-record some video and I will also prepare lecture notes and I will post the video and the lecture notes together. Okay? So in order to find the video and the lecture notes, you can go to Canvas, and uh, go to the uh, modules type, okay? If you click modules here, uh, I will have each lecture organized into a module. So in each module, you will find the one link to the video and also one link to the lecture notes, to the PDF lecture notes, okay? Uh, another thing I want to highlight is that for each module, I will also list the corresponding sections in Jackson's book. So if you want to read the corresponding section, corresponding text in Jackson's book, here is, where to find them. Okay, uh, let's go back to the homepage. Okay, so in addition to the module, there is another way to get access to the, uh, to the same information, to the, to, to the video and the lecture notes. That is to use the uh, course summary uh, section down below, okay, uh, and our Canvas homepage. Okay. So for the course summary section, uh, as, you, you, as you can see here, I listed the lectures and also my office hours here by dates, okay? And if you, uh, if you look at the date and you will find the corresponding lectures. Okay? And in addition, uh, typically, most of the time, I will create two events, the current lecture and the future lecture and the next lecture, okay? For the next lecture, you will not be able to see the module yet, okay? It will be posted later uh, when, uh, on that day. However, uh, from here, you can see the corresponding Jackson section that we are being going to discuss in the next lecture. So if you want to prepare the lecture and read the Jackson's book before looking at the video, before watching the video, here is where to find the corresponding section ahead of the time, ahead of the lecture. Okay. So one lecture is our current lecture and the next one showing here will be the next lecture, a topic as well as the corresponding section in Jackson's book. Okay. So if you click the link, oh, sorry, not this one. If you click the, sorry, uh, if you click the link for the current lecture, for this lecture, it will show you to the, lead you to the calendar. And here again, you can get the link to the module. It will lead you to the module. So you will find the module now. Okay. So bottom line, if you want to find the lecture notes and the video, uh, you can either go to modules or go down uh, in the course summary section. Okay. So that is about the lectures. And in addition to regular lectures, which is asynchronized, we, uh, I will also have an office hour where we can have face-to-face uh, 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 -face discussions. And I know it is very hard to get a universal time works for everyone. So uh, if you uh, uh, have other preferred, so I, ha I have one regular office hour every week, Tuesday night to 10 a.m. Okay? 
starting uh, in the uh, starting from the, 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 the second week, starting from January 26. I know that it's impossible to make sure that to, to uh, find the time that works for everyone. So if you have conflictions at this time, or this is not your favorite time, you can send, just need to send me an email and we can set up appointments. Okay. And this will be the link for our Zoom office hour. And the regular one is again, Tuesday, nine to 10, or uh, we can set up uh, appointment by email. And our uh, GSI, Miss Tech, also have uh, office hours. Uh, if you want to chat with her, you just need to send her an email and make a, a Zoom appointment. Okay, so that is about the time and the places. Uh, textbook. So you probably already have uh, Jackson's book. Okay, the book of Jackson is a great book. It contains a lot of uh, topics, almost everything related with GNM. You can find it in Jackson's book. So it's a great book to have. However, for this sem semester, for 506, this semester, uh, if you have Jackson's book, that's great. It's a very nice book. And we were basically, we were largely cover the topic of the second Jackson's book. Okay. However, if you don't have Jackson's book, it is also okay. Okay. So this will not be a required book for this part of the, this part of the, the C4506. Okay. Uh, I will post the PDF lecture notes. Okay. If you don't have Jackson's book by reading the lecture notes, you can follow the material. Of course, if you have Jackson's book, you can compare lecture notes with Jackson's book. It's great. But if you don't have it, it's okay. And for homeworks, I will also post PDF homeworks. Sometimes I will, we will use uh, problems from Jackson's book. But if we are using a problem from Jackson's book, I will modify it and I will type it in PDF. So even if you don't have the book, you can still do the homeworks. Okay, so textbook, Jackson's book is great, but it's not required for this semester. And the way we will have lecture notes posted every lecture after the lecture. Okay. Uh, and uh, if you uh, want some additional reading materials, so here are some optional books. So uh, for example, uh, uh, so the, uh, so, uh, oh, sorry, uh, let me see which one. Oh, so this is actually our, uh, uh, this is Jackson's book. And if you want some additional uh, reading materials, Griffith's book, uh, is actually a very good resource for undergraduate level ENM. And uh, uh, this is uh, another very nice book uh, on mathematical masters. Okay. Oh, and by the way, in this semester, because everything is online, uh, I believe uh, Jackson's book, as well as, uh, I think as well as the last book here, I'm not sure about Griffiths, uh, these books are all available online through our library. Okay. You can read Jackson's book fully online through our library if needed. Okay. So the next session is about uh, coursework and grading. So this semester we will have three sets of, uh, actually uh, three uh, sections of uh, courseworks. The first one is homeworks. The homework we will have it's weekly, okay? So every week I will post a homework on Wednesday and it will, it will be due uh, on the following week, Wednesday. The homework will also be posted through the module. I will also organize it into the module, okay? So uh, typically for a Monday module, it will have a video and the lecture notes. But on a Wednesday, for a Wednesday lecture module, it will have a video, lecture notes, plus a link to the homework problem. Okay? And the homework will be posted every Wednesday and due on the following Wednesday. Uh, by the way, the first lecture don't have homework. The first lecture is a Wednesday lecture, but this lecture don't have homework. The homework start from next week. Okay? And this problem set, we are count 60% uh, of your final total grade. Okay. And if you have some uh, uh, you know, conflicts or, or, or need some extra time for your homework, let me know. But uh, uh, if, you want, if you cannot turn it in on time, you should let me know ahead of the time instead of after the due date. Okay. And in addition to homeworks, we will also have two exams, the midterm and the final. So this semester, both these two uh, exams will be online and it will be take home an open book. Okay? You can uh, use any of your reference books and your lecture notes. Okay? And uh, the, uh, it will be roughly the same, roughly the following roughly the same procedure as the homework. Okay? So the midterm and the final exam would each count 20% for your final grade, for your total grade. Okay? And for the schedule of the midterm and the final exam, uh, we are planning to have the midterm exam and the uh, final uh, exam due due date on uh, March 10th and April 28th. Okay, so that's a tentative due date for midterm and the final exam. 
Okay. Uh, and uh, oh, well, one, one more thing I want to uh, mention is that uh, for the open book exam, midterm and final, you can use any books or notes, but you are not allowed to discuss with each other. It's supposed to be your own work. Okay. And in addition, softwares like Mathematica and the MATLABs will not be allowed. Okay. So you can use those software, if you use Mathematica or MATLAB to type your equations and to type your uh, uh, exam, that is fine. But uh, it should not be used for calculations to calculate your, 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 your problem, okay? Uh, and uh, one more thing I want to mention about grading is that um, the, the, the uh, partial answer will get, will, get, will get partial credit for you, okay? So if you know the rough idea of a problem and uh, you know uh, some of the steps and the write those steps down work at you uh, if it's in the correct direction it will give you partial credit okay so the uh, exam will be gra graded for steps instead of for final answer if you just give a final answer uh, you know come out of nowhere with no steps at all that will not be uh, it, it, it will not get it will not earn your credit by just showing the right answer the right answer uh, comes from the steps, showing the steps that you know how the right direction. Even if you show the right direction and the right steps, even if you don't get the final answer, you can still get partial credit for the, uh, for the, for the, for, for the exam problems. Okay, so uh, honesty, uh, I think I don't need to repeat this. Uh, and uh, 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 so this, um, uh, uh, I believe you guys are all have the honest training, etc. So you guys should know this very well. Okay, so this is our uh, course structure and all these details can be found through our Canvas uh, web page. You can either click home, home page or syllabus and that will lead you, lead you to this page and you can read more information, uh, information more carefully afterwards. Okay, so that is all about the courses and course setup. And now uh, when we have this uh, uh, course setup done, let's switch to the lecture notes and we'll start to discuss about physics. Oh yes, so sorry, I forgot one more thing. So before we start discuss of physics, one more thing is about the length of the video for each lectures, okay? So traditionally for 506, each lecture lasts one hour and 20 minutes long, 80 minutes lecture, okay? So for online video lectures, for online video lectures, we will try to keep the same length and the same pace, okay? However, uh, it is not really uh, exactly, it is not possible to exactly keep the same pace and the same length of the video, okay? This is mainly because uh, when we are doing the online lectures, we don't write down equation on the blackboard. So the pace of online lecture typically will be slightly faster than traditional lecture, okay? I will try to make sure that the pace is similar, okay? Online lecture usually has a fast pace and that's not good for digest material. I will try to slow down somewhere uh, during the lecture to make sure that you can enjoy the same pace as the traditional lecture. However, because it's impossible to be exactly the same, uh, so sometimes you will notice that the video, the length of the video may not be 80 minutes like traditional lecture, okay? So sometimes it will be slightly longer, sometimes it will be slightly shorter. Our target is to have average video length for each lecture to be uh, between one hour and one hour, and two, before one, 60 minutes and 80 minutes, okay? And we will make sure the pace is as close as possible to a traditional lecture. And we will make sure that we cover the same amount of material each lecture, roughly the same amount of material each lecture, same as a traditional lecture, okay? Okay, so that's all about background and setups. Now let's switch gears and talk about physics, okay? So as I mentioned early on, so Jackson's book is great, but the Jackson's book also has some problems, okay? So one of the main problem is that the, uh, the, 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 the sequence, the order, Jackson organized the material. Okay? So Jackson's textbook follows the very traditional way of Yan uh, of teaching Yan An. It's a chronic order, or say the time order, okay? So the story of the Jackson's book basically follows the historical time point uh, when this uh, series are discovered. Okay, so we start from the earliest knowledge, that's the Coulomb theory and the static uh, uh, electrostatics. Then we realize, as, as we discussed about magnetic statics, then we realize that the electrostatic and the magnetic the electrostatic theory is not right because uh, varying magnetic field, the generate field, the generate electric field. Okay, so we uh, add uh, uh, Faraday's law to the theory. 
Okay. Now we realize that uh, uh, the static theory of uh, uh, the, the magnetos uh, uh, static theory is also not right because the varying electric field generates magnetic field. So we add that. Okay. Now we realize that, oh, the foundation of the theory is actually wrong. The foundation of the theory is based on Newton theory. That is actually wrong. We need to modify that. And then we get special relativity, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So this is the so-called chronic order. It's what we discover, what we understand the, 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 the physics in history. So this is a great order and a great sequence for undergraduate ENM. Okay. So because it shows you historically how people resolve, how physicists resolve the puzzle of ENM step by step. But for graduate ENM, and after you have learned undergraduate ENM, now you are learning graduate ENM, for graduate ENM following the same sequence will be a little bit awkward, okay? Because if we follow this sequence, the right physics, the key and the correct physics only arise at the end of the semester. Okay, so at the beginning part of the semester, each chapters we learn some knowledge, but later we learn that knowledge is not quite right. There's something missing. Okay, we keep adding things, we keep adding things. Only in the last a couple, a last a few lectures, you learned the correct theory. Okay, so for undergrad, that is fine because you are learning it for the first time. But for graduate, that is not efficient. Okay, so only at the end of the semester, only for a couple lectures, you finally realize what's going on. Okay, so that's one reason we want to uh, adjust the sequence, adjust the, the order of the physics that's being discussed here. And the second reason, uh, the second problem about Jackson's book is that when Jackson discussed about ENM, he always mixed fundamental physics with mathematical methods together. Okay, so it has some good aspect, you know, directly connect fundamental physics with mathematical calculations. However, it makes it very hard to understand especially for the for the for, 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 for you know for the for people who read the Jackson's book for the first time, it's very hard to understand which part is fundamental physics and which part is just a math trick, just a trick in mathematics. Okay. So for that purpose, we will also try to address that problem by reorganizing the order of the material a little bit. Okay. So in this course, we will not follow the standard sequence, the standard chapter numbers of Jackson's book. We will reorder things. And basically what we will do is at the beginning and the first part and the first half of the semester, we were focusing on physics, fundamental physics. Okay. We will address most of the fundamental physics and the fundamental uh, assumptions and fundamental principles and their consequence in the first part of the lecture. Okay. And then all the mathematics and the, the, the second semester is applying this fundamental physics to various problems. Okay. And when we apply these fundamental principles to solve various problems, we will need the math tricks. And the math tricks mostly goes to the second section. Okay, so that's the rough structure. And another thing I want to highlight before we start today's lecture is that, so we will start the lecture by discussing about special relativity. Okay, then we will discuss about symmetry properties of ENM, where you uh, already learned some of the symmetry properties in the first semester. Okay, then and the ultimate goal of the first uh, half of the semester is to show you that Maxwell's equation is not accident, okay? It's not that accidentally people discover Maxwell's equation looks like this, okay? The Maxwell's equation, it turns out, if you understand the fundamental physics, like the special relativity and the symmetry properties, Maxwell's equation is a necessary consequence. There's almost no option, okay? If you write down, if you modify the theory a little bit, you will see that we're running into trouble. Why into trouble about you know violate fundamental laws of physics, the fundamental principles of physics. So Maxwell's equation is more or less, is pretty much the only allowed theory once we understand the fundamentals. Okay, that will be the uh, the key focus of the first half. Key focus of the first half is to show you from special relativity and from symmetry and other physics fundamental principles, uh, Maxwell's equation is a natural consequence. And once we understand that Maxwell's equation is a natural consequence and there's the impact of special relativity, et cetera, then in the second half of the semester, we will discuss about its consequence and where there is problems, okay? So we will start from special relativity, okay? And I know most of you have learned about special relativity to some extent, at least in your undergraduate education, okay? So special relativity is not something really new for most of you guys, okay? However, I still want to go through special relativity slowly, much slower than Jackson's book at the beginning of the course, okay? 
Part of the reason is because we are use we are need to use uh, many of these concepts later. And another important reason is this course is probably the last opportunity for most of you to really think about fundamental assumptions of special relativity. Okay, so I want to go really slow and make sure that every one of you after this course is really understand the foundation of special relativity. That will also help us to understand the next part of our lecture, uh, the impact of special relativity on ENM theory. Okay, so let's start from the special relativity. Okay, so our first chapter would be about kinematics about special relativity. Okay, and in the second chapter, we'll discuss about dynamics. So kinematic, uh, kinematics is a terminology that describes the motion of an object without asking why this, the, 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 it moves like this. Okay, we are just trying to discuss how to describe the motion of a particle, or motion of an object. Okay. And the next chapter, we'll discuss about dynamics, about why it moves like this. Okay, so the first question, what is the speed of waves? Or more precisely, how do we define the speed of waves? Okay. This is actually the fundamental question in the theory of special relativity. Okay, so for a wave, we know that any wave has three components, the source that generates the wave, the medium, where the wave in, in the medium of the wave propagates, and finally the observer, okay, the person or, or device who measure this wave. Okay. So that's the three components of any waves. Okay. And we know that waves have speed, okay, the speed of sound, speed of light, etc. But Newton also told us speed is a relative concept. If you want to define speed, you need to first define a so-called reference frame, okay? You first need to define a reference frame and any speed, any measured speed need to be respect to some proper reference frame. Okay? Without reference frame, the speed does not have any physical meaning, okay? So now here comes the question. If we have a wave and we are talking about the speed of the waves, what is a reference frame we are using? So the speed of the wave, like speed of light, speed of sound waves, what is the reference frame we should be using? Okay. For every single wave in our universe, almost every single wave in our universe, almost every single wave in our universe, we use the medium as our reference. Okay. So for example, when we define the speed of sound in a metal bar or in water, in liquid water, and the reference frame is actually this metal bar. Okay, we keep this metal bar stationary, then we measure sound waves in the metal bar, metal bar and we are measuring the, the sound wave velocity relative to the metal bar. Okay. If the metal bar is moving, then the sound wave inside metal bar should be the stationary value plus the velocity of this metal bar. Okay, so anyway, the speed of wave is referenced to the medium it propagates. So this is true for almost all waves existing in our universe. But after uh, Maxwell pointed out, Maxwell really demonstrated that light, actually are EMM waves, here comes the problem. The problem is that EMM waves don't have a medium. It can propagate even in vacuum, okay? So there is no medium. If there is no medium, we can't de define medium as a reference point. If we can't define medium as a reference point or reference frame, what does the speed of light even mean to us? Okay. If there is no reference point, no reference frame, what is this speed of light on ours? Okay. okay, so basically the first question that we're going to address in this section is what is a reference frame for the speed of light? Okay. Of course, if we go back to the original definition, the speed, oh, sorry, the light or any waves and these three components um, are made of these three components. Okay? As a result, the speed of light must be defined relative to one of them. Okay? There's nothing else in the system. There is only a source or medium, maybe a medium, and uh, observing the system. The speed of light has to be defined relative to one of them. Okay? So let's examine these three possibilities. Is that possible that the speed of light we're talking about every day is relative to the source? Okay, that's the first possibility. A second possibility, is there actually a medium for E and M waves and the speed of light is relative to that medium? A third possibility, is that possible 
that the speed of light is defined relative to the observer instead of the first two. Okay, that's the three possibilities we're going to explore. Let's start from the first one. Is that possible that the speed of light is defined relative to the source, to the light source? Okay. So the first possibility, the light source as a reference frame is immediately ruled out. So this is the simplest possibility. This is impossible. Okay, one can easily prove this is impossible. I will show you two reasons why speed of light cannot be relative to the source. Okay. The first one is on the theoretical side. On the theoretical side, this is because if you define, if, if we think the speed of light is relative to the source, then it violates a very fundamental principle in physics. That's so-called the principle of locality. Okay. So I want to highlight this principle because we are going to come back and utilize this principle uh, several more times in this semester. Okay. And it's a very important principle. So the principle of locality tells us that if the uh, 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 object, the motion of object can only be directly influenced by its immediate surroundings, by its neighbors. Okay? And it cannot be influenced by something really, really far away. Okay? So let me explain this a little bit. Yeah. For example, if we consider a waves, so this is a wave, elastic wave in a rope. And here is the source of the wave. This person is, uh, uh, is, is actually is moving the one end of the rope and it generates a wave. Okay. So if we look under this wave, obviously information from the source can propagate gradually to the wall, to the other end. Okay. However, the motion to the, at the other end is not directly influenced by the source. Okay? The information is not jumping from the, uh, the source to the other end. Instead, the information is propagating gradually, section by section. Okay? If we look at each section in the rope, uh, say, for example, uh, say, uh, let me use a, let me draw a picture here. Okay, say, for example, Let's look under this section of the rope. Okay. If we want to know the motion of this section, the motion of this section does not rely on the source. It doesn't care about whether my hand is at the top point or on the bottom point, it doesn't matter. If we want to know the motion of this section, what we need to do is the following. We zoom into this section and we figure out immediately the motion of this section only depends on the force of the neighboring section applied to this point. So if we want to know the motion of this section, the only thing we need to know is the force that the neighboring section applies to it and the force the other neighboring applies to it. Okay. Only neighbors apply force to this section. As long as we know what are the neighbors doing, we know this section want to go up or go down. And whether my hand at the same point and same time point is up or down doesn't matter. The only thing, the only information is needed is a neighbor, okay? So this is a principle of locality. The motion of each section only depends on the neighbors. Uh, in other words, if you want to propagate the information, the information can be propagated from one section of the rope to the next section, and then the next section can propagate the information to the next section and next section, next section gradually, okay? So this is called the propagation of information or propagate. Uh, so this is also why the reason is the reason why in quantum field theory, we use the terminology of propagator. It means that things are gradually propagated, okay? But the information cannot tunnel suddenly from one end to the other end. The information can only move step by step, step by step. That's the principle of locality, okay? So once we understand, oh, by the way, this principle of locality is extremely important and we will come back to this later. And in modern physics, people realize this principle of locality is extremely important because it's directly associated with uh, the very important concept of causality. And we'll come back to this. Okay. So the principle of locality is not something one can prove rigorously, mathematically. Okay. It is a principle that we believe to be true, but we cannot prove this mathematically. However, for all the fundamental theory we know in modern, you know, sorry, in modern physics, all the fundamental principles we know are based this principle of locality. Everything is local and nothing teleport. Okay? Everything just move gradually and then nothing jumps from one, uh, one end to the other. Nothing jumps suddenly from one point to a point that is far away. Okay? So this is very important 
principle. And this principle of uh, locality actually has uh, lots of important implications in, uh, in modern physics. Okay, so let me uh, give some comments. Oh, sorry. Uh, before I do that, uh, I, I, I haven't shown you the proof yet. Okay, l l let me do the proof first. Okay, so uh, the, the main uh, focus of this section is to show you that uh, the uh, speed of light cannot be relative to the source. Okay, so from the principle of locality, if we believe the principle of locality is true, then obviously the speed of wave cannot, any wave cannot be defined relative to the source. Okay, the source cannot be the reference, reference frame for the speed. Okay. The reason is because when we measure the speed of the wave, say we are measuring a speed of a wave for this section, okay, we're measuring how fast this part of the uh, oscillation is, is moving along the rope. Okay. If we are doing a measurement here, if we're doing a measurement here, according to the principle of locality, we only, it should only be influenced by its neighboring areas. What the source is doing doesn't matter. The source is far away. The source cannot have impact on this part. Okay. The motion here only care about its neighbors. It does not care about the motion of the source. And as a result, because the motion here does not care about the source at all, the velocity we measured here cannot be associated with what the source is doing. Okay. The source is so far away. The information about source, what the source is currently doing the information cannot reach this point. We need to wait the information to propagate here. So the matter should not be influenced by something far away. Okay, that's the principle of uh, locality tells us. And the principle of locality immediately prove as well as the velocity if we married here cannot be defined relative to the source. Because this measurement don't even have any information about the source and the same time point. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the main goal. From the principle of locality, we know that doing a measurement here we don't care about the source, so the speed of sound cannot, or speed of light, or speed of any waves cannot be relative to the source. Okay. Okay, let me say a little bit more about the principle of locality. Okay, so the principle of locality is a very fundamental and a very important principle, and we will see some more examples later. Okay, mathematically, it means that the theory is local. The theory has to follow any physics theory, need to follow the principle of locality. And uh, this principle of locality actually make, makes things a lot easier. Okay? The reason is because this uh, principle of local locality puts very strong constraints on our physics principles. So many of the you know, weird possibility is ruled out by the principle of locality. It makes things a lot easier. Okay? More precisely, mathematically, local or principle of locality means we have to be able to write down our theory in terms of differential equations instead of interval equations, okay? And the differential equation is much easier to handle than integral equations. Okay? You probably already noticed that in your undergraduate education or in our undergraduate education, most of us learn a lot about how to solve differential equations, but we almost learn nothing about solving integral equations. This is because integral equation is extremely complicated, much, much more complicated than differential equations. And when we translate it into physics, this means in physics, if the theory obeys the principle of locality, it can be written in terms of differential equations. So things become a lot easier. Okay. If a theory do not obey the principle of locality, then in general, we don't have differential equations. We need to handle integral equations. And integral equations are extremely complicated and very hard to handle. And luckily in our universe, the principle of locality is right. So everything is much simpler. Everything is differential equation. So it's much easier to handle, okay? If our universe choose to violate the principle of locality, we will find that all our physics laws becomes integral equations and those are very nasty objects. Okay. And another thing I want to mention is this principle of locality actually has very important constraint on physics laws, okay? So for example, if we think about say Coulomb's law, when I was learning electrostatics as undergraduate, uh, when we learned Coulomb's law, one thing I was wondering, I was asking to myself, is that why this Coulomb's law is one over r, okay? Why is not one over r to power, say, 1.00001? Or why, why is not one over r, you know, 0.9999, okay? Why is one over r? Why is exactly one over r, the Coulomb potential, okay? And if you look at the Coulomb's law itself, 
The coolant's law itself cannot explain to you why it's one over R. This is because coolant's law is written in a integral form. And in a integral form, you cannot see the impact of the principle of locality. Okay. To understand why it's one over R, what we really need to do is to go to the differential form, the Gaussian equation. Okay. If we write down the Gaussian's Gauss law, Okay, for the Gauss law, to write it in terms of the differential equation, the first equation in the Maxwell's equation set. Okay? Once we write down the coolant theory, the, 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 the coolant law in terms of the differential equation, then we realize that if the coolant law could be written in a differential equation form, the power must be one over R. It cannot be any other power. If the coolant law is not one over R, it's one over R, say, to the power point, uh, 1.000001, that means this potential cannot be written in a differential form. That means it's violated the principle of locality. It's so really the principle of locality showed us the coolant law must be one over R and R to the power one exactly, okay? That's the power of the locality, the principle of locality. And in fact, probably you already learned this and probably you already learned this in the previous semester. If we assume the principle of locality, there's only two possible potential we can have. One is coolant law, one over R, the other is the so-called Yukawa potential, one over R multiplied by exponential decay. Okay. Only this type of potential can be written in terms of differential equations. In other words, only this type of potential obeys principle of locality. If you have any other potential, one will not be able to write them in terms of differential equation, we'll have to use some integral, like you know, in Coulomb's law type of formula. And those formula cannot be converted to differential equation. In other words, those law violate the principle of locality. So principle locality actually tells us a lot. Okay, it tells us like the power of coolant potential can only be one and exactly one. And you cannot shift this value uh, by, by any amount, if, even infinitesimal amount. Okay, and uh, uh, before we go to the next section, uh, I want to mention one more thing about the locality. Okay, that is, although we are saying that everything need to follow, every physics principle need to follow the principle of locality, there are two objects in physics, while it, the principle of locality. We will come back to this later. The two objects are quantum wave functions and vector potential or gauge field. Okay. So that's the only two quantity, or only two objects in fundamental physics that violate the law of locality. Okay. And the reason these two objects violate the law of locality and it's still okay is because these two quantities are not physical measurable quantities. We can't directly measure a wave function. We can't directly measure a vector potential or gauge field. We'll come back to this later. And because we can't directly measure them, those objects are just, in some sense, they are just the mathematical tools we utilize to describe the physics. It's not physical observable. Because they are not physical observable, it's okay for them to violate the principle of locality. It's, you know, for example, the quantum uh, wave function can have long range entanglement, particles spin up and down if you have, uh, you know, single it and separate them far away from each other, the entanglement is still there, okay? So that is okay. But any physical measurement, any measurable quantity will follow the principle of locality. And another interesting thing we will discuss, we'll mention later is that these two objects, vector potential and quantum wave functions, both of them, of them violate the principle of locality and it's not accident. Okay, this quantity actually closely related. You probably learned the minimum coupling in quantum mechanics already. Okay, so quantum wave function and the gate transformation are closely related. Okay, because they are closely related, if one violates the principle of locality, the other one must also. Okay, so this is a, so you know in principle we say there are two objects violate principle of like locality, vector like potential and the quantum wave function. But at the end of the day, there is only one object because these two objects are closely related. They are pretty much the same thing. Okay, so that is a little bit too far away from what we are discussing here. Nevertheless, the bottom line is the principle of locality is very important. Okay, and principle of locality tells you if you are marrying the quantum, uh, sorry, the, the speed of light here, the source doesn't matter, the motion of the source doesn't matter. So from the principle of locality, the source cannot be the reference frame for the speed of light. Okay, okay. of course, this is just a theoretical argument. Okay, theoretical argument, it sounds fancy, but it cannot be trusted unless it is experimentally confirmed. Okay, we also need to have the experimental evidence to rule out the possibility of light source 
being the reference frame of the speed of light. Okay. And the first experiment of that type was done several hundred years ago. Okay. Uh, although people didn't realize what they were doing at that point, but the first experimental evidence can be traced back to several hundred years ago. So this is a picture of uh, the, the, the so-called crab nebula. Okay. So this is one nebula in the, uh, somewhere in the universe. Uh, and it was discovered about 300 years ago, slightly less than 300 years ago. And this is one picture. Okay. And this crab nebula was the remaining of a supernova explorer. Okay. So there was a supernova explorer and this explorer shoots out dust and all kinds of stuff in all directions and form this nebula. This nebula was discovered about 300 years ago, but the existence is much, has much longer history. The supernova explorer actually happened uh, around 1000 AD, about 1000 years ago. So about 1000 years ago, there is a supernova explorer. Then gradually this dust becomes larger and larger and larger eventually form this supernova. And this supernova was there, but we didn't notice that until several hundred years later. Okay. 700 years after the supernova explorer, people observed this nebula. Okay. So this supernova explorer was noticed and was recorded uh, by Chinese, uh, by, ancient, uh, by the ancient Chinese. And you can find the, uh, the, the, the historical record about this supernova explorer. And this nebula was observed by uh, people from, uh, by, by the English astronomer, uh, John Bewis, okay? And although there is a 700 year difference, people eventually established the connection of these two events and demonstrated that these are exactly the same thing, okay? So this supernova explorer due to this crab nebula, uh, people observe, okay? So because this comes from a supernova explorer, let me draw a cartoon picture here, okay? Let's assume there is a supernova explorer here and it shoots dust around all different directions. Let, and this is our Earth, by the way. Okay. Let me focus on the dust shoots towards the Earth and also dust shoots that away from the Earth because dust is shooting all over in all different directions. But there are also, also uh, you know, dust shooting in a perpendicular direction. Those are similar. So let me focus on this, these two directions at this moment. Okay. If we believe the speed of light is relative to the light source, okay, then for the dust shooting towards Earth, the light emitted by this dust, emitted by this dust, should travel at the speed C plus V for, for us, for people, for observers of us on Earth, okay? Because the speed of light is relative to the dust. We assume it's relative to the light source. Light source are those dust, okay? And those dust is traveling at the speed of, at the speed of V. The speed of light is C relative to the dust. And then for, the, for us on Earth, the speed of those light emitted by this dust will be C plus V. Okay. And for the dust shooting towards the other direction, okay? And because it's, you know, the dust is traveling in the opposite direction. If the light emitted by this dust is also traveling with speed of light C, but relative to this light source, this dust, then for we on Earth, this light should come to us with speed C minus V because the light source is traveling in the opposite direction, okay? So here I'm assuming the light, the E and M waves, the reference, uh, the reference frame for E and M waves is light source, okay? So the light source and the relative velocity between the light source and the speed of light is C. That's the assumption here. I try to rule out, okay? So this is the assumption. And if this assumption is true, that it means for dust that shoot towards Earth, light travel with a faster velocity for, for, for us, for, 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 us uh, for the observer Earth. But for dust that shoots away from the Earth, light coming to Earth should travel at a slower velocity for us, for observers on Earth. Okay. Then it means there will be a time difference for we to observe light uh, uh, emitted by this dust and the light emitted by this dust. And that this is the difference. Uh, say L is the distance between the star and the Earth. And the C minus V is the time it takes for this light signal to reach Earth. And C plus V in the denominator is the time cost for this light waves come to Earth. Okay. And if we calculate the difference between this, okay, because the speed of light is much larger than the velocity of this dust, 
we can immediately get this approximate formula. And L over C, the distance between uh, the supernova and the Earth is uh, 5,000 a year, uh, 5,000 light year, which means L over C is 5,000 a year. Okay. Velocity, velocity of this dust relative to speed of light. Velocity of this dust is uh, about uh, 1,000 kilometer per second. Okay, so this can be uh, estimated and can be calculated and can be measured from how fast this crab nebula expands. Okay, and the velocity over C is about 0 0.005. If you multiply this number together, it means that it were, there will be a 50 year difference. Okay, so we will take first this signal, the signal sent out by um, dust traveling towards us, we'll first pick up this signal. And then 50 years later, we'll pick up the signal from dust traveling away from the universe. This means if this assumption is true, then when people from the Earth look at the supernova expansion, uh, explorer, the supernova explorer will appears to you know, last 50 years at least. Okay. So even if the supernova explorer is an instantaneous object, but because the signal comes to Earth, some signal comes to Earth earlier, some signal comes to Earth later from people on Earth, we were we look at the supernova. We were we were think the supernova lasts fifty years. Okay, however, that's not true. According to historical record, this supernova only lasts for two years. Okay, that's more than one order's magnitude smaller than the estimation we was performing here. Okay. So this experiment or this observation basically rules out that the speed of light cannot be defined relative to the uh, the, 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 the light source. Okay, and in addition to this historical uh, experiment, there are also modern experiments of the similar type. For example, one example is a binary star. Okay, so we know some of the star form the binary system, two stars rotating around each other with very fast speed. Okay, but when two stars rotate around each other with a very fast speed, the uh, speed of the, the light source, light source are these two stars, the speed of light source is changing very rapidly and very dramatically. However, if we measure the light uh, emitted by those two stars, their light velocity does not seem to depend on their velocity. Okay, does not seem to depend on their velocity. So bottom line, the velocity of the light, the speed of light we measure on Earth, doesn't seem to depend on the light source speed. Okay. And another example, I think this example was discussed in Jackson's book. That's the experiment performed by CERN and the CERN. Okay, and the CERN, uh, you know, basically one can accelerate the particles at a very high speed, almost to the speed of light, then measure the light emitted by, emitted by those particles. So even if those particles are traveling almost at the speed of light, the E and M waves sent out by those particles still travel at the speed of light. Okay. The, this CERN experiment proved to very high accuracy that the speed of the, the, the motion of the light source does not change the speed of light at all, okay? With accuracy 10 to the minus four, at least, okay? So no matter how the light source moves, the speed of light always remains the same, okay? So we ruled out the first possibility. The speed of light cannot be relative to the source. The motion of the source does not matter for any matter of speed of the light, okay? So if the light source, sorry, if the speed of light is not relative to the source, then we have only two options left, either medium or the observer. So is the speed of light relative to the medium or the speed of light relative to the observer? Okay, so let's look at the second option, the medium first. Okay, so is that possible that the speed of light is relative to the medium? Okay. So this picture, the biggest question, this picture actually, uh, this, this this possibility, the speed of light probably is relative to some medium. This was the most popular theory, the most popular picture in Maxwell's time, okay? And the reason this was the most popular picture is obvious because every other wave we know, the speed of wave is defined relative to the medium. Sound wave, elastic waves, water waves, water surface waves, all of them is relative to the medium. So at that time, people think E and M, since it's also a wave, there must be a medium and the velocity must be relative to the medium. Okay. So this is the most popular possibility. 
Uh, although this is the most po pos possibility, po popular possibility, there are there were indeed open questions people didn't understand and people want to address. And most importantly, there are two, there were two open questions. Okay. If we believe the speed of light is relative to some medium, then we need to answer two questions. First of all, what is this medium? Okay. Because we know E and M waves can travel in vacuum. And the vacuum at least in the most naive sense, has nothing there. And what is a medium? Okay, so that's the first question we need to answer. And the second question we need to answer is, what are the physical properties of, those, of, of that medium? Okay. So quest, the first question is actually easy to answer. Okay, the first question is, what is a medium? What is a EMM medium? So for physicists, if we get this type of question, what is a medium of EMM waves? Okay, this can be answered easily. What we always do is, we give it a name. Okay. Once we give it a name, the first question is answered. Say the name, it happens that people choose the name uh, luminiferous ether, or simply ether. Okay. Just give it a name. The medium is called ether. So now if you ask me what's the medium of and wave with, I will tell you it's ether. Okay. Just give it a name. However, this is just a language trick. It doesn't actually answer any physics question. Okay. It does not tell us the second question, the answer to the second question, what are the property of this ether? You can talk, you can call it ether, you can call it whatever you like, but you have to, but as a physicist, we have to answer what are the basic property of this ether, okay? And in the time of Maxwell and before special relativity, a lot of efforts was paying to this direction, okay? The name is simple, we call it ether. Now, what is ether? What is a property, okay? And it turns out when we try to understand this ether, things start to fall apart, okay? Uh, I want to give you the answer first, and uh, at least uh, the, the, the bottom line first. The bottom line is, if we take this picture, although there is no one single experiment that can prove this theory, this ether picture is totally wrong, but if we want to use ether to explain physical observables and the physical observations, we keep running trouble, okay? If we want to explain it for one experiment, it will lead to consequences that conflict with another experiment. Then, if we add some component to fix it to the to 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 to, to you know to cover the second experiment, then it will run into trouble with the third experiment. So keep, things just keep running to self contradiction. Okay. So the bottom line is nothing really proves this ether picture is totally wrong. It's impossible. However, it you know by using this ether picture, things become more and more complicated and more and more. Um, and natural, it, 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 it doesn't look very natural. We'll need to keep fixing the, 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 the theory by adding some new component, which doesn't look right at all. Okay, so let's, let, 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 uh, let's discuss about physics. Okay, so ether, okay, let's assume there's ether, that's the medium where E and M waves travel. Okay. If you assume there's ether, ether is a medium of E and M waves, and E and M waves need a medium, then we need to assume this ether, this object, fills up the entire universe and also vacuum. And it also fills up solid materials. For example, in glass, there must be ether so that uh, E and M waves can travel in glass. Okay, so e and, uh, ether is everywhere. On the other hand, we cannot feel it. We cannot touch it. Okay? And uh, we cannot create an ether vacuum. So for example, if we use a vacuum pump, we can pump all the airs out of a vacuum tube. Okay? but we can't pump ether out. Somehow we will try to pump things out. Ether stays, we can't move those ether, they stay in the tube. Okay. And another question that people actually explored was that whether ether has a viscosity or not. Okay. This comes from the, the following picture. Okay. If we assume ether fills up the entire universe, then if we look at our planet, uh, Earth or star or the sun, okay, then our planets and the Earth is basically like fish swimming in the water of ether. Okay, so ether is everywhere. Our planet is moving inside ether. If you take that picture, the fish swimming in water picture, then immediately it comes to a question. There is a question pops up. Does this water have viscosity or not? Okay, is this is a typical, typically if we have object moving in water, we will feel viscosity and the things will start to slow down. Okay, it will try to slow down moving object. Okay, but if the ether has viscosity, it means that when we move Earth, when the Earth spin, uh, sorry, moves around the sun and uh, the ether will gradually slow down Earth. And the Newton's equation tells us if Earth gradually slow down because of the viscosity from ether, then we will start to fall 
into the sun eventually. Okay? But that never happened in billions of years. So from that fact, ether probably is, doesn't have any viscosity. Okay? It does not slow down any object moving in it. So liquid with auto viscosity, in other words, this is basically the so-called superfluid. Okay? So that is actually already some, some it, it looks suspicious. Okay? We, we know that it's very hard to create the superfluid. Okay? And the superfluid everywhere, this looks suspicious. And more importantly, if we assume the ether is viscosity free, then it immediately comes to a contradiction to a very important experiment. That's the Michelson uh, Molly experiment. Okay, so Michelson Molly experiment. I think most of you already learned it, so I'm not going to details. So basically, Michelson Molly experiment measures the sound. Of, sorry, the speed of light with very high accuracy, and they measure the speed of light whether it change uh, in a year or not. Okay, so basically, uh, when Earth goes around the sun, the velocity of the Earth is keep changing as we're moving around the sun. Okay, sometimes it goes this way, sometimes it goes that way. If you assume there is a background ether, okay, and the ether is moving with a constant velocity described by Newton's first law of Newton, then the relative speed between Earth and the ether should change depending on you know which part of the year we are. Okay? And that relative speed change should least if the if the sound velocity of the sorry if the speed of light is relative to ether then when we marry it on earth because the relative speed of earth and the ether is changing then uh, we should observe the speed of light changing you know of when earth is here or when earth is here so if we marry the whole thing in the period of one year we should see the velocity going up and down up and down with periodicity of one year but where Michelson and the moly is very accurate Speed of, uh, speed of light measurement in the Fermi's measurement did not observe any change in speed of light velocity. Okay, so in many textbooks, this experiment is said to prove ether does not exist. Actually, that's not true. Okay, this Michelson Moly experiment does not prove that ether does not exist. It only proves that the ether, if it exists, cannot be cannot have a fixed velocity everywhere. Okay? If the ether has a fixed velocity everywhere, it's moving you know, together with the same velocity, then indeed, that's disproved by Michelson uh, molar experiment. But Michelson molar experiment itself does not prove ether cannot exist. Instead, you know, for people who are holding the ether picture, the way they explain Michelson molar experiment is the following. They say that, oh, this is typical. This is just the trap. Okay? If ether has viscosity, then the Michelson molar experiment will be naturally explained. Okay? So for example, if we have let's say submarine moving slowly in water, because of the uh, viscosity between water and the submarine surface, the water near the submarine will travel with the submarine. The viscosity of the sub viscosity will drag some water near the surface to move with the surface together. Okay? So if you measure the relative speed between water and your summary. For a very thin layer near the surface of summary, you will find that the water is traveling with the summary. Okay? So similarly, if there's viscosity between Earth and the ether, or some other type of force between Earth and the ether, then Earth can grab some ether with it. When Earth is moving, it will grab this ether and move it with Earth together. Then if you measure the speed of light, you are, will find it's not changing because the ether is moving with Earth. And if you are measuring Earth, the speed of light will never change. Okay, so that's actually the ether picture of molar uh, of Michelson molar experiment. However, this explanation immediately comes to a problem that contradicts to the previous picture we discussed early on, where ether cannot have viscosity. Okay, if we assume Earth can grab ether, now according to Newton's third law, ether also grab Earth. If ether grab Earth, it will slow down Earth, and eventually Earth will fall into the sun. But that never happened. So we need to assume that ether is viscosity free, so it does not slow down our Earth. But at the same time, it also has viscosity, so our Earth can grab ether. Okay, so that's some type, that's one type of self-contradiction I was mentioning earlier. Okay. On top of that, so this is only one aspect of problem in the ether problem. Another aspect it comes from the, uh, the, 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 the puzzle, whether ether is a liquid or solid. So early on, I mentioned that the ether is 
we, we think about Easter as a liquid and you know, our star and planet are fish swimming in the liquid. That analogy is actually not right if you think more carefully. Ether is actually not a liquid. Instead, it should be more like a solid. The reason for that is about the polarization of waves. In a liquid, or elastic waves in a liquid, we know e liquid can only support so-called longitudinal waves, which means the oscillation direction of your wave need to be parallel to your wave vector k. Only solids can support transverse waves. Okay, so in, in a solid material, there are transverse waves where your motion of your uh, particle is perpendicular to the wave vector k direction. And the light, E and M waves, are transverse waves. If E and M waves are transverse waves, we have to believe that ether is a solid, it's not a liquid, it's a solid. So it can support shear uh, deformation and hence shear energy cost. So it gives you transverse waves. But if ether is a solid, how can our star and planet, how can planet Earth moves in a solid without getting slowing down by the medium, by the solid? So we are moving in a solid, we, with our vacuum is filled, uh, filled up by a solid, but we can still move in a solid. That doesn't sound right either. Okay? And even if we assume ether is a solid, there's still a problem. Because in a solid material, in addition to two transverse waves, a solid material also have a longitudinal wave. And the longitudinal wave should have a higher velocity than the transverse wave, except for some very special cases. Okay, so longitudinal wave usually have a higher sound velocity and a sound higher, higher wave velocity. So if we have two transverse wave EMM waves observed, there should be another longitudinal modes with a much higher velocity. We have not yet observed. You know, that's what should happen if ether is a solid. But that third longitudinal mode was never observed in any ENM systems. Okay, so that was another puzzle and problem of this solid-like user picture. Nevertheless, you know, for every single experiment, if you show me a single experiment, I can always come up with some explanation. Say, oh, okay, yes, user picture explains this. But if we combine all the experiment together and try to fit with the picture of ether, then we find that we we'll keep running running into problems. Okay. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention another. A problem about this ether picture. Okay, if we believe there is a medium, and the E and M waves travel through this medium, then there is also the, the, the problem about the linear linear dispersion. Okay, because in a typical medium, say you know water or sound waves, uh, or, uh, sorry sound waves in a metal bar. Okay, the sound waves in a solid. If we uh, measure the velocity, sorry measure the frequency as a function of wave vector k, typically this function will be quite complicated. Uh, it's, if we can take a Taylor expansion if k is small. It will have a linear component, it will have a k to the third component, k to the fifth component, and a higher order component. Okay? So that's what typically happens for sound waves, say, in a solid, in a medium. And for almost any medium, the frequency, you can do it a Taylor expansion. Okay? It will have a linear component, a higher order component, etc. And then if we take a derivative of omega, d omega dk, this is a group velocity. Okay? If we calculate the group velocity using this expansion, then we find that again, the group velocity, the linear term gives me a constant. The k to the third term gives me a k square, k to the fifth, taking d to become k to the fourth, etc. The bottom line for any medium, okay, for any medium we know, if we measure the group velocity, the group velocity will change as a function of k. Okay, if we measure the different wave vector, different modes, different frequency, different wavelengths, they will have different group velocity. But for E and M waves, at least for vacuum, very high experimental accuracy to very high experimental accuracy, the group velocity never changes when we change k. No matter what frequency we lock, they have exactly the same group velocity. Okay? This means for some magical reason, this third power coefficient, fifth power coefficient, the seventh power coefficient, all those coefficients happens to be exactly zero for E and M waves. Uh, for a typical medium, we never see such example. For a typical medium, there are always some coefficients here. It's never zero. It could be small. Some media could be small. Some is large, but it's never zero. But for E and M waves, magically, all of them are zero. Okay. That's another picture against the ether. Okay. If ether is, if there is a medium like ether, it's called ether, and this ether, even if it's there, it's not the same as any medium we know. Any other medium has 
some non-constant group velocity, but these are somehow mathematically have constant velocity. Okay. So nevertheless, as I said uh, early on, there is not a single experiment tell us ether is totally wrong. It definitely cannot be there. But if we try to uh, compare multiple experiments together, trying to unify multiple experiments together inside one theoretic framework, we will run into trouble. Okay. So for this experiment, we need to assume this property of ether. For that experiment, we need to assume ether has a different property. But when we try to connect them, it's very hard to make sure that ESA, there is one theory picture that globally fits uh, all the experiments. That is extremely challenging. Okay. And that is a point where some people, some people here means uh, Albert Einstein, pointed out, well, there's still a third option we have not tried yet. Okay. So we tried the first option and proved that's not right. Okay. It's not relative to the source. We tried the second option very, very hard, assume there is a medium called ether and everything is relative to ether. And it's not total failure, but uh, we don't get anywhere, okay? So instead of trying to improve this ether picture, how about let's look at the third picture. Maybe the sound velocity is relative to the observer rather than to a medium, okay? So this picture was, which, as you all know, resisted by the community for some time, and at least resisted by many people in the community for some time. The main re resistance comes from the fact that, uh, one of the main resistance comes from the fact that previously, none of the waves we know, the speed is relative to the observer. It's always to the medium. Why is this one is special? Why this one should be the observer? Okay, so that was one of the, one of the, uh, one of the main uh, reasons that people don't think that is right. However, if we carefully think about the problem, okay, if the sound will, sorry, not sound will, speed of light is relative to the observer, at least logically, it's okay. And it does not violate the principle of locality. Okay. So the, uh, we mentioned early on, the source cannot be the reference frame because if the source is reference frame, it's violated the principle of locality. I'm marrying the, 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 uh, the speed of light in this area I should not care about what the source is doing. But if it's a third option, if it's relative to the observer, I'm marrying under this area, and my observer is also under this area, it's local. It does not violate the principle of locality. At least the third option is much better than the first assumption, okay? So why don't we just give it a try, okay? So that is exactly what Einstein did. Einstein said, okay, since the second option then the same, so lead anywhere, let me, Let's think out of boxes. Let me think out of the box. I think about whether it's possible that the third option is actually the right answer, whether it's possible that the speed of light is relative to the observer. Of course, at the end of the day, we know Einstein is right, okay? But before we know Einstein is right, let me first explain to you the correct procedure for a theoretical study of this type. For a theoretical study, after you make assumption, like what Einstein made, okay? The first step is to check the so-called self-consistency, self-consistency check, okay? So Einstein said, let's assume speed of light is relative to the observer, okay? Then what we need to do is we need to start from this assumption and then derive all the consequence. And then show that this consequence don't contradict with one another, with each other. And this consequence do not contradict with ex existing experiments and do not contradict uh, with existing, with fundamental principle of physics, we believe must be true. For example, principle of locality. I have already demonstrated to you, the principle of locality is fine. It doesn't show any, it shows no contradiction, uh, even if we assume uh, the, the, the observer is a reference point. Okay, the principle of locality is fine. Uh, we also need to do, but we also need to check everything else. Okay, we need to check. There's no self-contradiction in the theory and it does not against any existing experiment yet, okay? Of course, this self-consistency check does not prove this theory is right. It only proves this theory is logically right and mathematically self-consistent. We still need to, the second step, is to apply this theory to experiments and give experimental observation, give experimental prediction, and let experiment check whether our universe really follows this mass or not, okay? Mathematically correct does not mean it is really true in our universe. 
it could be a logically right theory for other universe, but it may not be our universe. We always need experiments to tell us whether this self-consistent theory is right or not. Okay. But before the experimental test, the self-consistency check is very important. We need to make sure that the theory at least is self-consistent. Okay. If the theory has self-contradiction, then it cannot be the right theory. Okay. It cannot be the right theory at all. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes in theoretical studies, uh, people try to come up with theories which are not self-consistent and try to apply those to experiments. Of course, this is that's not the right thing to do. But fortunately, Einstein carefully checked the self-consistency and compared his theory with ex existing experiments. Uh, and that's, that's what we're going to discuss in the next part. Okay. And I think this will be a good point to stop. And in the next lecture, we will discuss the consequence of Einstein's assumption and discuss about the, the, the so-called Lorentz transformation. But before we dismiss, I do want to mention one more thing about special relativity, okay? That is, could Einstein be wrong, okay? So after Einstein proposed this idea, he checked self-consistency, then he, you know, made predictions, like the most famous one is like the uh, energy equals mc square. Uh, by the way, uh, our uh, discussion about uh, uh, this chapter and the next chapter uh, will also cover uh, how did Einstein comes, with, comes up with that conclusion and what is the reason he believed that conclusion is right. Okay, we'll discuss that later. And he made several predictions and those predictions was gradually proved by experiments one after another. Okay, and uh, so nowadays physicists, we believe Einstein is right, the theory of special relativity is right, but occasionally there are always experiments that pops up saying that they find a violation of Einstein's special relativity, okay? Can those claim be correct or not? Could Einstein be wrong, okay? Could Einstein be actually wrong? The special relativity is not the right theory about the other universe, okay? First of all, I want to emphasize that the special relativity of Einstein has played a, it is it's actually played a fundamental role in modern, in modern quantum physics. For example, the quantum field theory in particle physics, the Einstein's special relativity is a hidden assumption in all of those theories. Any concurrence, uh, sorry, not any, many concurrence we take as granted in you know, particle physics actually has a hidden assumption. Einstein's special relativity need to be right. So we have this concurrence, et cetera. Uh, for example, there is one theory, so you can prove that if you have special relativity, then the spin of fundamental particles can only be, uh, cannot be larger than two, cannot be larger than two. So, you know, and that is true, okay? Uh, so, because Einstein theory is playing such an important role, it's a hidden assumption in almost all existing like uh, particle physics quantum field theory, uh, you know, if his theory is wrong, then we will be in big trouble, okay? It's not just, you know, make some small modifications here and things will be fine. It's almost every single knowledge we have about our uh, quantum, uh, about our quantum and classical understanding of the universe need to be modified. And secondly, because Einstein's theory, Einstein's prediction has been proved and has been verified with very high accuracy in many, many different experiments. Even if Einstein's theory is wrong, it's possible his theory could be wrong, it cannot be very far from the truth. At least for all the energy range we checked right now with our experimental tool, Einstein's theory must be very, very close to the true physics of this universe. Okay. Of course, if we go beyond the current experimental range, new physics may arise, but within current experimental range, the, the deviation from Einstein's theory must be very tiny. If it's large, then it will have major consequence that, all, that, that many, many of our existing experiments will be wrong. It will be disproved by, by our expecting, uh, experiments, okay? So this is part of the reason, you probably know this, uh, like about 10 years ago, uh, scientists in Italy claim that when they study neutrinos, they find that neutrinos is propagating, is moving at the speed of, at the speed that larger than the speed of light. So this was a big news about 10 years ago, and it was on social media and everywhere had a big impact, okay? However, I will say in the physics community, the impact of that claim is much weaker than in the, you know, among the public, 
Okay. The reason in the physical community the impact is much less is because the velocity they observe, they claim for the neutrino is too high. It's not a tiny bit larger than speed of light. It's a significantly larger than speed of light. If the neutrino travel speed and thus the, 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 that speed significantly higher than the speed of light, then it will have many consequences. That means Einstein theory is you know, wrong with a very big error. Okay? If that is true, many other experiments should see the signal. Okay? The reason that the, the fact that it only seen in one lab experiment and that experiment is in contradiction with many, many other experiments tells us the result is very suspicious. Okay. Of course, after a few years, uh, sorry, after uh, like a, a couple years, uh, they figured out it's because one of the cable was not tightened properly. If you tighten those cable, everything becomes fine. It still travels less than the speed of light. However, that is actually, uh, I think, an important lesson uh, we learn. That is, if we want to question a fundamental theory, we need to question it with a ground, with at least self-consistency check. Okay, We need to check something we come up with, we are saying, is at least not logically contradict with itself and not contradict with ex existing experiment, with established existing experiment. Okay. okay, so I think this is a good point to stop. So today, let me summarize, we rule out two possibilities. Actually, we didn't rule out two possibilities. We rule out the possibility of the light source. We showed that the second possibility leads to a very complicated uh, picture which is not helpful, which makes things very, very complicated. And we run into self-contradictions all over the place. And that leave us to almost no other choice but to explore the third option like Einstein did. And in the next lecture, we'll explore what Einstein did and see what will happen if the speed of light is defined relative to the observers. And it turns out by just making that one single assumption uh, plus a couple other hidden assumptions, which we'll discuss in the next lecture, uh, it leads to a very specific and a very unique theory of special relativity. We don't have any, we, are, we have almost no freedom to choose. We have to go that path. Okay, I think this is a good point to stop. And I will see you next week.